It has an American unit on show. It doesn't mention the country which, this country, which first made it mandatory. It doesn't mention um, uh, the uh, country that first flew one in the air, which is this one. It doesn't mention the push we had for 14 years to get the Americans even to recognise the value of it. Um, Dr David Warren lamenting about the failure of Washington Smithsonian Institute to recognise an Australian invention. And this is it, the world's first flight recorder or black box, which he and his friends developed in the 1950s and 60s. Ironically, it was the failure of another world first, the first civilian jet called the Comet, that inspired the Warren idea. Warren wasn't an electronics specialist, but rather a fuels expert with the Aeronautical Research Laboratories. He sat on a committee considering the Comet's problems. I kept thinking to myself, if it were a pilot error or if it were something which were known to the crew, they may have said something or done something. If only we could recapture those last few seconds, it would save all this argument and uncertainty, we'd know what it was. Somebody may have known. And I had been, just the week before, to an instrument exhibition and seen this. Now, this is the world's first pocket recorder, if you like, the Minifon, a German unit, which records on about two or three miles of very fine wire, as thick as your hair. Inspiration is one thing, but selling an idea is quite another. Our first effort was to try and get the Australian authorities on side, and so we wrote them a letter, and their reply was uh, to go and send us three pages of what was required then in aircraft, as if we weren't quite sure, uh, and then the statement, and so you see Dr Warren's invention has no immediate significance in civil aviation. Now, that Eventually it was the British and Americans who manufactured and refined what is now standard equipment on all commercial aircraft. The flight recorder experience was incredible enough, but it wasn't the only one of Dr Warren's ideas to be met with bureaucratic indifference. This prototype of a crash beacon recorder has done little more than gather dust since its invention in 1960. The beacon, or plastic mushroom, was a joint Australian-Canadian development which aimed to reduce the likelihood of destruction of the flight recorder and lead to its instant retrieval. Rather than have your crash recorder buried at the bottom, we said there is an, another alternative. We can always have a crash recorder inside the plane where we can get at it easily to see what's happened in the last flight, or we can put it in the tail where it's most likely to survive in an impact, or we could build it onto the back in one of these so that when it flips off, even if the plane is lost and even if every survivor is lost, the radio says, come and get me immediately, and when you do get there, the little spools, which have all the information we need, are actually housed in this beacon. We couldn't carry the whole recorder, it's too heavy, but by making the spools detachable, we worked with the Canadians and were able to make this combination which can be retrieved and so you've got the data even if you haven't got the aircraft. How could this sort of thing help in modern day air crashes, for instance the Air India tragedy? Had there been one on the uh, Air India plane, uh, search aircraft could have been there within say half an hour uh, because the Mayday signal, the distress signal, is monitored all the time in various parts of the world and as soon as captured you could set out as quick as you could start your motors. Had there been survivors, had their pilot been uh, in the vicinity and uh, still floating, we might have rescued him. If the, exp the popular theory seems to be that the jumbo jet, the Air India jumbo jet, exploded because there was a bomb on board, now if that happens, what's to say that something like this mushroom wouldn't go up with it? Uh, it could have been, if the bomb had been underneath, it might have destroyed uh, the mushroom on the outside. I think more likely it would have blown it with a, 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 uh, the support of the structure underneath, blown it clear, and it still would have uh, landed in the water. It may have been destroyed, uh, but that's a fairly remote chance compared with uh, something locked in the aircraft over 2,000 feet of water. So, some 30 years on, it's no consolation to David Warren to know that bureaucratic stonewalling caused all his hard work to be lost to Australia.